Uh, welcome everyone, great to see you all. Uh, this has been really fun. Uh, I had a, a really fun session with some of the cast members earlier, just going over some of this stuff. Um, Charles said we have until 3 o'clock, which is a pretty good chunk of time. Um, I would be delighted to do whatever would be interesting to you folks. Okay, uh, we could do some Q&A. I can tell a little bit about my background, how I got involved. Uh, we can learn some phrases, whatever. Uh, before that, tell me a little bit about, about, about you folks. Uh, you, you're all Disney fans, I understand. Yes. yes. <laughs> all right, I'll start. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, big Disney fan, big Avatar fan. A little, Great. little nerdy with this stuff, with the Avatar language. Okay. I run a website called BigFatPanda.com, which is a YouTube channel mostly and blogs and stuff uh -huh. like that. Uh -huh. But uh, loving the whole avatar and was very interested in the whole language thing even prior to this. Fantastic. Right. right. Anybody else? Yeah, we're yeah. here with uh, Attraction Magazine. I, I have been a pass holder for years and then uh -huh. went to college and now working here at Walt Disney World. And I've seen the construction of Pandora since its beginning. It was just dirt all the way to what it was now. And oh, I was wow. there on opening day and Everything about this land has just absolutely blown my mind. It's just way beyond what I even dreamed. Yeah, well, you're not the only one who's blown away. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I work for a blog, InsideTheMagic.net. Um, oh, okay. We do have, like, a YouTube channel and also oh, a website as well. And we essentially okay. cover mostly Disney and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I'm a lover of the theme parks as well. Yeah. Grew up in Orlando. Coming Excellent. Time. Well, uh, I, I've, I, I, I've been having a ball. Um, we were hoping to be able to be here for the opening in May, but uh, there were things that prevented us from coming. But uh, it's great to be here. I'm actually here for two reasons this time around. One is to meet with, 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 with you folks and to meet with the cast members. The other is that um, there's an annual Avatar meetup that takes place every year. And this is the seventh annual meetup. And uh, my husband John and I have attended all of them. Uh, it was it was Seattle, Seattle, Virginia, Los Angeles, Colorado, uh, Pittsburgh, and then this year it's here in Central Florida. Of course, the reason that we're here this year is that is that people who attend can see the theme park, you know, which they've been so eager to see. Uh, we have a very dedicated group of fans, um, some of whom come every year. Uh, this time around, we had a guy fly in from Germany, a fellow from Sweden, another guy from the UK. So we have, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you we have tens of thousands of people, but we have a very dedicated hardcore group, uh, some of whom have learned the language to the point that they're actually using it for real communication all the time. I mean, I get emails written to me in the language absolutely all the time. <laughs> Okay. And and completely, we we have, and, and and by the way, this is not false modesty, but uh, there are people who speak and use the language better than I do. They've actually learned it to the point where they've they've really made it their own, and they've they've adopted it. We have people writing poetry, we have people writing short stories, we have people writing movie reviews. I mean, it's really quite, quite. It, it, it's it's one of the most thrilling things about the whole enterprise to me. Um, to tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a linguist. I have a PhD in linguistics. Uh, for some strange reason, I found myself, and, I, and actually it's a wonderful position, I found myself teaching not in a linguistics department, but in a business school. I was a professor at uh, the Marshall School of Business at USC. Uh, retired seven years ago, so now I'm, I'm an emeritus professor, which is really good. It gives me a gold card, which allows me to park on campus free for the rest of my life. It's a very big deal. Uh, and it was back in 2005 that someone sent me an email saying, I think this might interest you. It was a friend of mine, uh, Ed Finnegan, of the linguistics department at USC. I had done my graduate work in that department, but at this point I was totally divorced from that in, in the business school, so I would never have seen this email if it hadn't been forwarded to me. And it said, you know, this sounds like you. I think you might be interested. In it. And it, it turned out to be a solicitation from James Cameron's production company asking for a linguist who could develop a language for a science fiction film. At, the point, at, at that point, no one ever heard the name Avatar. It was Project 880. Okay. Anyway, I looked at it and said, 
this sounds great. I, wa I want this. And so I essentially applied for the job. I sent uh, James Cameron a copy of the workbook that Ed and I had written together, a linguistics workbook. Um, sent an enthusiastic letter. I soon got a message, hey, why don't you come and um, meet with Jim? So I had this incredible 90 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one, with James Cameron. It went well. At the end, uh, we stood up, shook hands, and he said, welcome aboard. And my life has not been the same ever since. So it's, it's, it's been an amazing experience being involved in the language, um, seeing how a movie is constructed, meeting people I'd never thought I'd meet in my entire life. Um, and uh, as you know, we are working on four sequels. Um, filming has begun. We, uh, the expected uh, debut dates are uh, 2020, 2021, then a gap, then 2024, and then 2025. So with that, um, anybody have any questions? Yes. Sure. Did you have this language at all, like already semi-created, or did you start from scratch based on information you received from Mr. Cameron? Absolutely from scratch. Did not have any, anything created at all. In fact, uh, I had never really created a language before. Did you think of that? Like, was that something you thought about creating your own, you know, language? Was that a okay, thing? Okay. Well, um, I mentioned this linguistics workbook that uh, that I had co-authored. It's called Looking at Languages. Um, it's made for. Uh, it, it's an academic book. It's made for an introductory linguistics class. Linguistics, which, as you know, is a scientific study of language, it's a little bit like math in the sense that. You're not going to learn it if you simply listen to a lecture. You've got to do it. And so typically, in linguistics classes, students, after they learn certain principles, are presented with problems. Here's some data in a language you've never seen before. Figure out what's going on. And so our workbook provided that kind of data. Now, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning all this is, is for two reasons. First. For one of the problems, I had created just a little beginnings of a language for a specific purpose. The language was called speak to me. Uh, but the other thing is that for one of the subsequent editions of the book, I had put together an exercise for students in Klingon. Now, Klingon, as you know, is kind of the granddaddy of well-constructed, linguistically viable and legitimate languages for entertainment. Uh, uh, there, of course, there are Tolkien languages, which are amazing. But prior to that, you could kind of get away with gibberish. You know, kind of the goo goo wah, wah and okay, that's, an, it's a, that's a, an alien language. Well, after Klingon, that does not fly. And it, and, and, and it has to be a language that actually stands up to scrutiny, that has grammar, that has phonology and morphology and syntax and semantics and all, all the things that go into a real language. Um, and so that really was my only background in constructing language. Did I ever think that I would construct a language that anybody could actually speak? No. Okay. Um, I know a lot of languages borrow from each other, mm -hmm. um, but in the, creating this entirely new language, did you have any basis, or what did, what did you base it on to get the beginnings of the language? Yeah. Um, first of all, it's not based on any earth language, uh, contrary to what some people have said. Okay. Now, I didn't start from absolute scratch because James Cameron had come up with about 30 words on his own. These were mainly character names, you know, Neytiri, Moat, for example, uh, names of places, uh, names of a few animals. So I took a look at that list, and again, it was just words, it wasn't any grammar or anything, and I kind of looked at what the sounds in, the, in, in that list were. And it reminded me a little bit of a Polynesian language. I think it may have had something to possibly to do with the fact that, um, that Jim had recently come back from New Zealand and may have, maybe have had some Maori in his ears. So um, I kind of, well, well, one thing I knew was that I had to incorporate that little bit of vocabulary into the language. And so I created a sound system, phonetics and phonology, 
that would incorporate those words, but also be expanded and incorporate a lot of other stuff. So that, that was kind of a central core of the thing. Um, once you think of the sound system, then you have to think of the morphology, how the words are built up. And then finally, how the words are put together in sentences and phrases. There was another part of your question, I'm sorry, that I, I forget about. Um, well, I just wanted to know, I mean, how did you, um, I mean, you said that you based this on what, what Cameron, the, the words that Cameron had gave you, but how did you come up with, like, the full? Yeah, with, with the full vocabulary. I mean, uh, most of it is just, okay, here's a sound system. The, the, the first thing you have to do is decide and have, have a very clear picture in your mind of what the sounds are in the language. And just as importantly, what the sounds are not. Because every language, whether human or alien, draws on a certain set of possible sounds. So for example, all human languages draw on the set of sounds that human beings can make. Kind of makes sense. But the particular sounds that a particular language will use varies from language to language. There are some sounds that, that are almost universal. I mean, Every single language I've ever heard of has an M sound. But not every language has a th sound or a th all or, or you know, many, many other things. So you have to decide on what, what sounds are in the language, what sounds are not in the language. Uh, Navi has some interesting rules about that because it has some very familiar sounds. It has some unusual sounds from a Western perspective. It has these things called ejectives, you know, the t and the p and the a. But it also omits certain very familiar sounds. Navi does not have a B, a D, or a G. A G a, it has an NG, but it doesn't have a G. So if you see a word with B, D, G, that's not Navi. Okay? It doesn't have a CH. It doesn't have CH. And some other things. So you decide. Then you have to decide on what combinations of sounds are possible. Also, what positions certain sounds can be in. Uh, one notorious thing about Navi is that it has this ng sound at the beginning of a word. So the word for you is ng, n-g-a. Now, the ng sound is very familiar in English. We have it all over the world, sing, bring, hung, whatever. What we don't have is that same sound at the beginning of a word. If you speak Indonesian, if you speak Thai, if you speak Vietnamese, it's the most natural thing in the world. But for most Western speakers, it's, it's a challenge. That's probably the most challenging thing that the actors had to deal with. Making, making the ng sound at the beginning of the word. Okay, so once you're very clear on the sound structure of the language, then you can begin to create vocabulary. Now, how did I create vocabulary? Mostly, let's make up a fun sounding word for whatever. You know, and uh, I, 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 that is maybe sort of the, the, the vaguest, cloudiest, sort of most artistic part. Okay. You know, how, how do you decide what the word is going to be for woman or for people or for, or for child or for tree or anything like that? Let's make it up it's according, according to, to the rules. Uh, make it up so that it's going to fit into sentences or that people will more or less be able to pronounce it That's, that, that, and, and whatever. There is no inherent connection between a word and what it represents. Okay. Okay. So, uh, now, when it comes to continuing to expand the vocabulary. And by the way, this is something, this is an ongoing process. You know, I'd love to tell you that the Navi language has 40,000 words. As, as native speakers of English, we all have a command of, it varies, a, a passive command of probably at least 40,000 words. Okay, if you look at, in, uh, at, 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 at a totally unabridged dictionary, I've heard estimates up to a half a million words in English. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, Navi doesn't have anything close to that. So the language is continuing to expand. I have a blog uh, in which I introduce new vocabulary on an ongoing basis. Uh, we have grammatical discussions and so on. So when a new word, when, when, when the need for a new word comes up, and, and let me digress for a moment. I think this is fairly unique because we are actually getting input from fans about what new vocabulary should be. At, it, it began with my soliciting requests from people. 
who are using the language on an everyday basis. I say, look, let me know what words you need uh, immediately, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to, to create them. And now you realize that was a mistake. Okay. Uh, it, it, well, <laughs> okay. well, well, well it, it, I, I realized something <laughs> interesting about it, and that is there's, there are people who know the language so well that not only could they ask for it, please give us a word for this, please give us a word for this, but they could say, hey, what about this word, what about that? They've actually come up with vocabulary themselves because they know the rules. So I said to myself, hey, wouldn't it be great if the fans could suggest a word and I would accept it, and then years later they would hear it on the screen and they would say, hey, that's my word, that's my word. <laughs> So we now have, have a system where uh, there's something called the LEP, the Lexical Expansion Project. Um, there's a whole hierarchy. There's a rotating chair. I mean, I had nothing to do with this. The fans totally set up by themselves. And um, every so often, I get a document which contains suggestions for new vocabulary. Not just requests, but actually suggestions for new vocabulary. And I can do one of three things. I can say, I love it. This is fantastic. It's in the language. I can say, basically a good idea. I think we need to tweak it a little bit. Or I can say, I'd like to do this a different way. Uh, everything is submitted to me totally anonymously so that I have no sense of who submitted, so that there's no sense of ownership and you know, rejection if I don't like anything. But that's been working pretty well. Awesome. Yeah, so th that's kind of thing. Uh, I know this is a very long-winded answer to your question. Uh, just one more thing. T to come up with innovations vocabulary, there are essentially three things you can do. One is make up a totally new word. Okay? That's from scratch. Another is borrow from another language. Now, l languages do this all the time. If two languages are in contact and one language has a word for a concept which doesn't initially exist in the other language, but then they decide that they need, they need to use it. Very often, a borrowing will take place, but the borrowing is always filtered through the borrowing language's phonology, which is to say you have to adapt it to what you can pronounce. So, the Japanese word for football is futobaru. Okay, that is football filtered through Japanese phonology. Futobaru. Okay. Um, so, Nabi does the same thing in relatively rare cases. So, the Nabi don't have gunships, okay? But gunships exist in the movie, and uh, it would make sense for the Nabi to need a term for that after the sky people have landed, because they see they see gunships. Okay. So, what's the Nabi word for gunship? What we simply did is take the English word gunship filter it through the Navi pronunciation system, and it comes out kunsip. Uh, uh, an even simpler example is book. Okay, the, uh, Navi is not a written language. And so like many, many languages on earth, it's simply a spoken language and communication exists. Spokenly, it's handed down orally. So they don't have a word for book, but they encountered books through Dr. Grace August, or Augustine's classes. So what's the Navi word for book? It's po. Okay. There's no B in Navi. The closest letter is P. And so book, book in English becomes po in Navi. Okay. The third way is to take existing elements in the language and combine them into ways. So these are like compounds. So the word for computer in Navi is eltu lef nga. Eltu means brain. Lef nga means metallic. So a computer is a metallic brain. That's yeah. OK. Let's go ahead. Yeah. So um, I guess from the time you met with James Cameron and kind of discussed the project, how and I guess from the time of filming, and I know you kind of said there is no official like set finish with the language. Right. But from where it, I guess, from meeting with James to the production of the film, how long did it take you to make this language? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wish I had taken better notes when I was doing it. Uh, it was definitely a matter of, of months. I mean, I mean, I guess maybe between f three and six months. I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, but 
what I developed for the film was the language that covered the needs of the film. Okay. It, it didn't necessarily go, be, go too far beyond that. And of course, the, the development of the vocabulary was guided by the needs for the film. So if someone was talking about running, I knew I needed a verb for run. If no one was talking about walking, I knew that I could hold off on creating a verb for walk. That could come later. So the actual development of the language just in terms of what came before something else was guided by the needs of the film. Was there, was there ever a, um, a word that you created that James didn't like the way it sounded on film and he had you change it to something else? <clears throat> Boy, that's a good question. Uh, not to my recollection. I do remember, though, very vividly that on set, um, one of the actors was not pleased with the way a certain word sounded. Uh, I remember what the word was. Uh, it was the word for go. And um, the actor said, how am I going to say go? This one? And, and I said, well, the word is cat. And the actor said, cat. Terrible word, terrible. I don't <laughs> but that, that was a word, and eventually it was fine. Yeah, so, so I mean, people definitely had reactions to certain words. But on the whole, things went, went pretty well. And there, there, there were certain words, of course, that really caught on um, with the cast and crew. The, the, most, the best known example is the word for moron which was part of the script, which you had to come up with. Anyone know it? Scowl. It's spelled S-K-X-A-W-N-G. And that was a word that for some reason people really <laughs> glommed onto and adopted. And uh, crew members would turn to each other and say, you, you scowl. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of fun. Where can, you had mentioned about the annual Avatar meetup. Yes. Um, where can people find information on that for new enthusiasts who haven't already been a part of it? Avatarmeet.com. There we go. Yeah. I'm really interested in, did you need visuals or did you use visuals to come up with the language? Was there any available to you and did they help in your creation? Uh, visuals. Well, I mean, for words for the flora and fauna. It was important for me to have visuals and also descriptions of what they were because um, there are certain plants that do certain things, certain th plants that have sort of exploding seed structures. So, so for that, I would take the word for explode because, you know, I, I had to kind of think, what would the Navi call this particular plant? What would they call this particular animal? Sometimes it would be just an entirely new word. But sometimes it would be uh, a word that represented something about the, the plant. I mean, in English, uh, we have daisy. I don't know if daisy means anything other than name of the flower. But then we also have sunflower. And sunflower, I, I assume, reflects something about, about that. So, I mean, we have both of those things in that way as well. So, to that extent, visuals were important. Um, for the grammatical stuff and for, and for basic verbs, no. Since there is going to be so many more movies coming out, do all, does everyone who lives on Pandora speak the same language, or are there different dialects of Navi? Uh, it would be unusual for there not to be different dialects of Navi. Okay. Yeah, just as there are so many different dialects of English and so on. Yeah. Sure. So how many words did you actually create for the first movie, and, and then with the sequels coming out, how many... How much has it expanded? Yeah. Um, I actually have, have an interesting story about this. Uh, as for how many words, I mean, I, I think the original vocabulary list for the first movie had maybe about 500 words. Uh, it soon expanded after that. Uh, John is smiling about something because we, 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 we had kind of an interesting little experience. Uh, the movie came out at the end of 2009. And 2010 was an insane year. I mean, I, we were just traveling around. We, I, I was interviewed. I was on the cover of, of magazines and newspapers. It, it, was, it was really amazing. Uh, and we were invited. 
I, 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 I was invited to speak in uh, a number of different places, um, one of which was Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, there is um, a wonderful group called the, the Bonnier Group, a conglomerate of publishers and other things, and they have a retreat every year where they invite, uh, I think, typically 14 speakers over the course of two days. And it was, it was, it was quite a wonderful experience. When, uh, when, when I was invited in 2010, the theme was passion. And so we were, all, all the speakers, f representing scientists and uh, entrepreneurs and creative people, talking to speak about what kind of motivates us. So I was due to speak um, Monday morning, the first thing. And so we got there about 7 a.m. and um, we're sitting in the equivalent of the green room, I suppose. And then another speaker arrives um, who was the keynote speaker. Uh, I, won't, I won't reveal who it was, but it was, it was a, a fairly well-known personality that everybody would recognize. And this person came in with, uh, with an entourage and sat down. And um, there wasn't too much communication between us, but then at some point, person says, so who are you and, and what are you doing? So I said, well, um, I'm Paul Fromer. I, I created this, this language for the movie. I said, oh, yeah, I heard about that. Um, so how many words do you have? So I said, well, at this point, we probably have about 1,200 words. And the response was, 1,200 words? My parrot knows 1,200 words. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to myself, OK, well, <laughs> that's fine. But that was, that was kind of an interesting reaction to it. Yeah, so, so, but, but the, the vocabulary now has expanded considerably beyond that. And of course, as new needs arise, we, we, had, we had new vocabulary. Did you create some words specifically for the theme park uh, area? Like yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I, was, I was asked for, so for, for example, um, I was asked to create a word for fan in the sense of someone totally committed to, you know, an incredible enthusiast. And so we had a word for a verb for to be enthusiastic about something, which is soha. And one who is enthusiastic would be a sohayu. And one who is extraordinarily enthusiastic is a tan sohayu. So, um, so you folks would all count as an so are you, I think, yeah. Sure. So, um, I guess as you kind of said earlier, as like new movies come, you kind of get like asked to create more words. Uh -huh. So do you essentially get to see like the script for the film and then kind of translate it or is it, is that, wow, that is yeah, yeah. I, I, I get to see the scripts. And I get to see what is going to be in the language, and uh, and I essentially do a translation. Sometimes I will have all the vocabulary ready, and sometimes I'll have to come up with some new vocabulary. And that, that's pretty much how it works. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, I don't know how much cast member exposure you've had, but are there words or phrases that are easy or hard for them, or maybe? Just apply it, actors to that, or yeah. Well, I, 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 there definitely are things that are easy, and uh, well, let's put it this way: there are things that are harder than others. Okay, and um, the cast members are doing real a really good job. And we had, we had a really great session just before you folks arrived, where you went went over some went over some stuff. Um, and by the way, we can we can talk about some some of the words as well. Uh, the word for hello is notoriously difficult. It's kate, which which is which is kind of tricky. Uh, there are some words that are a lot easier. Thank you is irayo, and by the way, that's a James Cameron word. That that was one of the original words that he had come up with, and so that is not that, that that's fairly accessible, I think. Um, the things that are hard, typically about the language, and really about any language that you're studying, whatever is not in your language is going to be a little more challenging than stuff that's very familiar to you. So, for example, the, as, 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 as you mentioned, the, the NG sound, putting that in the beginning of a word is a, is a challenge. These ejectives, uh, 
which are probably uh, the most quote unquote famous part of the language or unusual part of the language that people have uh, been talking about, which I've notated as PX, TX, and KX. These are sort of popping consonants that sound like a, u, e. And if you listen carefully to uh, the dialogue in the movie, you'll, you'll, you'll hear some of these. They're called ejectives. Um, they're perfectly legitimate sounds that are found in a lot of human languages. They're found in Native American languages. They're found in parts of Africa. They're found in parts of Asia and so on. Um, they're unusual to most speakers of Western languages. And so that is a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, how do you say, oh? Well, um, the way I've been explaining it, and in fact, I've, I, I actually found this explanation online a long time ago. Uh, it'll be spelled T-X-U, ooh. So in order to pronounce it accurately, the first step is to make a T sound as loudly as you can without breathing. So it'll be okay? And then you add the vowel, so it's ooh. Ooh. And then as you practice it, you shorten the gap between the consonant and the vowel. So you begin with ooh, and then shorten it, ooh, and eventually ooh. And so that's, that's what most people have, have, have done to, to, to make it successful. Um, so how do you help people learn to say hello? How, how do okay. you break it down for Well, them? I mean, I mean uh, so it's... So it's two syllables. Kal is easy enough. Kal. K-A-L. Kal. Uh, and that, that's the very first thing on, on the list. So the, the T-X-I, um, two parts of it. There's a consonant and there's a vowel. The vowel part is perfectly familiar in the English. I. I. It's, the, it's a vowel in sit, big, pick, whatever. Perfectly. What's tricky about it is that that vowel in English, does not occur at the end of a word. It's always followed by a consonant. But in Navi, it can occur at the end of a word. So it's I, I, which is, which is not hard. And the TX, I, I, and then eventually I, and eventually I. And then you put it together, I. I. I think tick, but without the CK. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah but right. hard. Okay. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so, um, I mean, I, I've been doing this for 10 years now, and so it's become fairly natural to me. In the beginning, it wasn't easy for me either. But it is something that you can practice, and it's something you can work on. And people do it, and people get a lot better. Yeah. This is your voice on the translator? Uh, yes. That's what I was looking okay. at. Which is really funny. It's going to make you laugh, because there was one word. I was like, this guy doesn't say it right. Uh oh But now I know, obviously, <laughs> they were wrong, and you are correct. Which, which word is it? You know, know, I don't remember. It was something that I definitely heard in the theme park. Okay. And I remember when I got the translator home, I was like, wow, they really messed that up on the translator. Okay. Well, I, 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 I mean, it's possible. I, <laughs> no, no, I no, I don't think so. Okay. I, think, okay. I, I think you're right, and I'm hearing it wrong from, okay. from okay. one or two people. It's, it's very but it's an awesome thing. Okay. Um, is there any, are there any particular phrases that you'd like, uh, like to practice on here? Uh, as, as, as you see, it's sort of divided up into... I thought the number system, I the, the uh, number. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. So this is on, um, on the second page. Um, as I may have mentioned, one of the things that I noticed when I was looking at the prototypes of the Navi is that they have four digits on each hand rather than five. And it occurred to me that that would imply that their counting system would be based on eight rather than ten. And so I asked James Cameron about it, and he said, absolutely. So the Navi counting system is octal rather than decimal. In other words, you, it, it's based on groups of eights rather than groups of tens. So the way you count is one to eight is ao, mune, e, sing, mr, poka, kina, vol. Nine is eight and one, vola. Ten is eight and two, vomu, that kind of thing. So everything is based on, uh, on eight. What, I, what I've um, given there is, is the ordinary decimal number and then how it would be written in octal. So in octal, uh, the number eight would be written one zero, 
because you, you know the, the the placeholders are not one ten hundred but one eight sixty four, right? What sixty four times eight? Whatever. <laughs> 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 okay. 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 Yeah. Um, okay. So the word for Pandora, which you see um, in the middle of the bottom list, is Ewa Evin. Ewa Evin. Uh, th uh, that's a compound. It actually means child of Ewa. So uh, Evin is the word for child, and Ewa is Ewa. Uh, there are two forms here. Ewa Eveng is the proper dictionary form. Eweveng is the short form, which is colloquial and perfectly acceptable. So, to say welcome to Pandora, it's Zolau Nepurte Eweveng. Do you have, and this could be like a simple question, but do you have like a translation for like Walt Disney World? They're like. I. So, I mean, it, 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 Walt Disney World, that would be a good, uh, a good example of, tr of putting, s putting an English phrase into not be Walt Disney World. I mean, I mean, what would Walt Disney be filtered through the not be sound system? Uh, it, uh, so a not be word could not end in LT. So you'd have to add a vowel there. It'd probably be... And, and the vowel aw doesn't exist in now. It would be the A or O. Uh, if it were A, it would be Walte, it would be Walt. Walt. And Disney uh, would come out Tizini. So it would be, uh, it would be something like Walte Tizini. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Is there a word for world already? Keith K. Kifke. Kifke. Okay. Yeah. That sounds actually really cool. And so it would be Walta Tizidnie Kifke. That would be, be, that, that'd be like the world of Walt Disney. I like that. Hey. Can, I, can I get an unofficial spelling? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, um, let me give it to you at the end. Okay, that's I'll, fine. I'll be happy to. No. Yeah. And, and it also give me a chance to think about it a little more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. because, because the problem is that everything I say becomes canon. Mm. <laughs> okay. What did you say your blog was that deals with the evolution of the language? Yeah, it, it's um, Naviteri. It's N-A-V-I-T-E-R-I, -E which means about Navi. So it's naviteri.org. And there it is. Now, sometimes languages evolve over time. Yes. The land here is set 100 years later than the right. first movie. So was any of that dealt with the language? Yeah. Um, in terms of evolution over 100 years, I don't know if we have anything, anything like that. However, if you want to do a good job constructing language, you have to think historically. And you have to think over time. So in other words, uh, you have to think about how a word, especially a compound word, would have developed over time. So um, a good example would be the two words I've given you for Pandora. I mean, Ewa Eveng might have been the original term. But then you think, okay, people are going to be speaking this colloquially over a period of time. Uh, how will the word change, typically? Because people whether on Earth or Pandora, are lazy. But, but lazy sounds pejorative, and I don't mean it that way. I mean, maybe a better word is efficient. They want to, they want to use the least energy to, to, to communicate. And so Ewa Eving would very likely, probably the first step would be that the glottal stop would be weakened. Ewa Eving. So you, so you think of kind of stages. Ewa Eving is the original. As you speak, the glottal stop probably would become weaker, ewaeving, and then ewaeving would evolve to ewaeving. So, so that's, that's the kind of thinking that you really have to do over time. How would things that were originally this way over the course of maybe thousands of years evolve into what we have today? And that's the kind of thinking you did 
to create the language that was in the movie. Yep. But you had to figure this started thousands of years ago. Yes, exactly. Right. We probably have a couple more minutes. Anybody have some last questions? Or anybody want to want to want to try some? I, I, how about I see you, which, which, which is which kind of nice. So um, that's that the the number the number two phrase on that. So it's well not the So um, the way this breaks down is well is a form of the word I, nati is a form of the word you, and kameye is a form of the word to see. I've capitalized the S and C because it's the kind of sea that, it's not the physical sea, but it's the spiritual sea. I see into you, I relate to you, I understand you, I accept you. So it's, well, nati kamea. Let's kind of try it. So the first word is well. 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 Okay. Now, the second word, you, in the object form is nati. Nati. Yeah. And what you have to do, you have to feel the NG kind of in your throat. Nati. Nati. So it's, well, nati. Okay. Okay. The, the third word, by the way, let, let me point something out here. Um, I've underlined certain parts of words. Okay. This is important because that indicates a part of the word that's stressed. Stress in nati is unpredictable. So, if you don't know the language and you just see that word, you might think it's kameye, but it's not. It's kameye. So that's where the stress goes. So it's well nati kameye. Try it. Well nati kameye. I see. Uh, by the way, as you notice, there are different ways to say the thing depending on who you're talking to. So if you're, uh, navi doesn't have just have a singular and plural. It has a singular, a dual, a trio, and a plural. Plural is four or more. So, to say, I see you to one person is well, ngati kamea, two people, well, mengati, three people, well, engati, and to four or more people, well, angati. Why make it that complicated? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, no, no, but, 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 but uh, I, I, I wanted to do interesting stuff with the language, but not outlandish stuff. So, I think virtually everything in the language will have some count counterpart to an existing language on Earth. Uh, so, as people have, have noted, there are little parts of the language that, that work a little bit the way Hebrew works. A little part that work the way Persian works. A little parts of the language work the way Chinese works. And so on. Uh, that's not a coincidence because I think typically, at least for, I, I think for many language creators, including myself, the things that are most readily accessible to you are things in the language in which you've studied. So, I mean, I, I, I've studied some Hebrew, I lived in Iran for years, so I, I, I spoke Persian pretty well at one point. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Malaysia, teaching math in the Malay language. So, I know a fair amount of Malay, uh, studied Chinese for about a year and a half. I can say very little. I, I, can, I, I once learned about 300 characters, which is uh, probably what the average six-year-old knows. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, th but those kinds of things are to a certain extent reflected in the language. But the combination is unique. There is no language that has all of these properties. And also, I, I, I took things uh, to uh, a much greater degree than is found in some other languages. So, for example, for example all the verb, all the verbal morphology, the conjugations, uh, tenses, aspect, things like that. Everything is done in Navi, not by using prefixes, which is taking a root and putting something in front, not by using suffixes, but by using infixes. So in Navi, to change verbs from present to past or from continuing to completed, you stick something in the middle of the verb. So the verb for uh, for hunt, say, is taron, T-A-R-O-N, that's the root. To say that hunting has been completed, it's tolaron. So you take the O-L, put it in the, in the middle. To say that you may hunt is tivaro. To say you will hunt is tayaro. To say um, um, I have hunted it and I'm happy about it is uh, tolareo. So do some 
Earth languages do this? Yes, but not to the extent that Navi does it. So that's, that's some, of, some of the innovation that went into it. How are you pronouncing good day? Trrrlefpo. <laughs> yeah, so the double R is a very strong trill, and you can have fun with it. So, trrlefpo. Trr means day. Lefpom is an adjective meaning enjoyable. I really wanted to see if you were going to roll the R like I thought, so. Trrlefpo. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Anything else? It's not an Earth Kid influence. What's that? It's not an Earth Kid influence. <laughs> you know, I never thought of that, but I bet she'd be very good at that. She'd be, very she'd be good. fantastic. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.